recording the session. Uh, so, so uh, yes, this is the second session uh, of our forum, and it's the first online session. So there may be some bumps on the way. So you, I hope you you keep your patience with us. And our forum is uh, intended intended to promote um, collaboration and joint research. Uh, within London Met and uh, also forge collaboration with colleagues from other institutions and practitioners across uh, disciplinary lines. So those of you who don't know me, I'm Svetlana Stevenson. I'm, I, I'm one of the coordinators of the forum and uh, I'm very pleased to start today's event uh, which uh, is about varieties of nationalism and diaspora and in line with the uh, aims of the forum, we will be looking at this research topic from a variety of different uh, disciplinary angles. I'm sure you have all received the, the papers and uh, in their short presentations, our colleagues will discuss the issues of nationalism, uh, diasporas and identity in the global context. Uh, drawing on the perspectives of uh, politics, international relations, history and sociology, and also using a variety of research methods. And at the end, at the end of the session, we will discuss uh, the potential for further development of uh, this area of research and also uh, area studies at our university. Uh, we've decided to have a questions and answer session at the end, so please put your questions uh, in the chat box and I will, at the end of, of the presentations, I will call everyone in turn and you will be able to ask your question, uh, I, I either ask me to, to, to read it or you can do it yourself if you turn your microphone on. So, uh, our first speaker is uh, Erdi Edstok, and he's a lecturer in politics at London Met. His paper uh, is entitled New Turkey's New Diasporas, and it's co written with uh, Beha Basa from Coventry University. So, so, so Erdi, if, you, if you'd like to start your presentation, then you know, sure, sure. Uh, you can do it now. Sure. Thank you so much, Svetlana. Let me share my screen first of all. I think that's that's all right, right? You see, you can see my PowerPoint right now. First, uh, yes, we can. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, it's it's great to hear that we are we are full house in here despite the marvelous weather outside. And uh, let me let me underline one point before starting my presentation. This paper, actually, not this paper. This is a project, and there will be a couple of journal articles and the book chapters from that project uh, is being conducting with my colleague, with my wife, Bahar Bashar. But right now, I know it's against the feminist ideology. But she is inside uh, taking care of our four months old daughter so i will be the only speaker so uh, could you please excuse me if i will make any mistakes but this is a joint project i mean this project is about as i said like the new turkey's new diasporas uh, i mean the recently i mean the literature on the diasporas is a, is a kind of an uh, kind of an increasing star in the in the field of the political science and international relations because the increasing transnationalism and the multidimensional relations between the states increase the roles of the diasporas, migrants, and the immigration. And within these concepts, we have been discussing about the public diplomacy and the soft power uh, throughout the years. Uh, since the beginning of 1980s, I do not want to say anything about theoretically too much, actually too much theoretically in front of Don, who has been an expert about the diaspora studies. But like since the beginning of the new millennium, uh, with the increasing of the illiberal turn in the, in, the, in the global south and then the Western Europe, we have been scrutinizing the subject of the uh, diaspora governance, diaspora management, and the types of different diasporas and the state relations under the umbrella of the authoritarian or illiberal states. 
Under these circumstances, our research is mainly aimed to scrutinize the Turkey and it is recent diaspora governments under the Justice and Development Party, uh, the, uh, AKP, or you may, you may say the uh, Erdogan's governments. Uh, policy as a case study and we demonstrate that the diaspora governments can take both positive and negative forms and it enables the state to create transnational state approaches that can be ideological and repressive, uh, repressive, repressive uh, depending on the context. I mean, this is a kind of a big project, but in this part of the project, I will uh, only present the qualitative uh, comparative cross-country cases uh, that been conducted pretty much uh, 94. Uh, actually, it's more than 94, but the 94 of the interviews are quite fruitful to, to, to give some uh, issues from Germany, United Kingdom, Sweden, Netherlands, and Turkey. And also within these concepts, we conducted uh, interviews mostly who migrated and tried to become a new diaspora of Turk, new diaspora of the new Turkey uh, after 2016 or after a uh, very disputable, very uh, questionable coup attempt in Turkey. Within this uh, research, we conducted interviews not only uh, with the newcomers, we also conducted research, uh, conducted interviews with the imams, state officials, both from Turkey and both from the uh, host countries. If, if I would like to say a little bit about the uh, literature review on the state like diaspora engagements, I mean, during the last decades, the diasporas have been recognized as the emerging non-state actors in the international er arena. And great many scholars scrutinizing different diaspora groups and their relations with their states uh, in different angles. And also they have been scrutinizing the, the, the diaspora inside, inner dynamics and the diaspora's relations with each other. And also the concept of the diaspora management or diaspora governments is also using a lot within these processes because uh, after the after two after like with the beginning of the new millennium, states realized that diasporas could be could be used and instrumentalized another fifth arm of the states from also outside of their uh, territories. So uh, within this structure, I mean, states try to create different kind of policies according to their ideological uh, orientations or according to their political desires to control, to govern, or to manage the diaspora governance. Within this uh, situation, within this current illiberal transformation of the world, or the rising or the rising of the right-wing populist leaders, we scrutinize that recently a new scholarship is emerging to control the immigrants, or the control of the transnational space, or deterioratize the security policies, or exploitation of the domestic conflicts to abroad, or the new repressive ways to control uh, to, to to control and manage the diasporas. In our studies, we claim that there is a dramatical shift in the, the diaspora uh, land of the Turkey, diaspora lands of the new Turkeys, and also there is a dramatical shift in terms of the diaspora management. And this created a good and the bad diasporas from the eyes of the uh, home country, which is Turkey. And there is very different reactions from the eyes, from the uh, from the perspectives of the host countries, these are the mostly the Western countries. Uh, for this, I mean, this one, I, I need to give a little bit of background, historical background regarding to Turkey's diaspora policies. I mean, being a diaspora or sending any citizens to outside Turkey is not a new issue for Turkey, because since the uh, beginning period of the Ottoman sick man of Europe, I mean, the Ottomans tried to send many different migrants all around the world. And with the beginning of the, with the establishment period of the contemporary uh, Turkey, uh, Tur uh, Turkey, I mean, m great many Turks or the Kurds or the citizens of Turkey or the uh, Turkish originated people tried to migrate all around the world with many different purposes, job, welfare, health, or education. And these, this is a very, this is a very, uh, this is a very significant issue because Turkey is a very big country in terms of population and in terms of geography. And its diaspora is also quite big. So this is a very popular topic, uh, like throughout the uh, academic literature, but also this is a very uh, topical issue since 1980s, because the, in the 1980s, every, after the 1980s, every critical political junction in 
Turkey created a different kind of a diaspora uh, all around the Europe and all around the world. I mean, the Germany, Sweden, Netherlands, United Kingdom, one of the France, one of the significant examples all of, of significant examples of them. But in Australia, in in Russia, in in every single country, in every single uh, country all around the world, we can see different Turkish diasporic groups. But under the Justice and Development Party regime, we can see a very different kind of a diaspora attitude for on behalf of both diasporas and also uh, from the perspective of the Turkish state. I mean, there is a general, very repetitive connotation regarding the Turkey uh, that claims that the Kemalist regime was a secular democratic regime, and then the one day the Justice and Development Party Recep Tayyip Erdogan came to power and transformed all the country. I mean, this is a very uh, repetitive connotations, repetitive reading of the Turkish history. But the Turkish history, likewise throughout the Kemalist period or before the before the Erdogan regime, there is always based on some different critical junctions. This table that you can see is from my uh, forthcoming book. I mean, I categorize the AKP period into four different categories. The survival period, the takeover period, the challenge period, and the hegemonic period. I mean, if, if I would, like, this is the uh, party's attitudes in terms of foreign policy, in terms of uh, diaspora, manage, uh, diaspora uh, management, and the, the, then there are some, I mean, these all of these reactions uh, established or uh, coming up uh, after some critical junctions. We, not giving the details, I would say that, I mean, the Justice and Development Party started it is way as a very promising political party, not only for Turkey, but also all around the world, because they claim that they might be the representative of the uh, new political ideology, new political methodology, new political norm, which can be, uh, which can be, uh, create a compatible way between Islam and democracy. In this regard, uh, the very beginning of the process of the uh, Justice and Development Party is a kind of a survival process against the Kemalist or the, against the establishment of Turkey. But at the same time, it is a liberalization and also it's a uh, Europeanization period of Turkey. Within this process, we saw a kind of a different way of a migration, not, uh, not sending migrants from Turkey, but outside the Turkey. And also within this process, Turkey realized that, I mean, the diaspora is a very good actor. Diaspora is a very important actor. I mean, the, even though the Justice and Development Party is, uh, is a single party uh, since 2002, one of the main, uh, I mean, one of the main fascinating qualifications of the Justice and Development Party and Erdogan, who is a uh, political animal in terms of the Aristotelian concept, create an unconventional and uh, different kind of coalitions with different kind of bureaucratic groups. For example, the gentleman near Erdogan, as you can see, the Fethullah Gülen, right now claimed as a terrorist, but actually he's He's a para, he's the leader and he's the leader of an organization which is quite parapolitical. On the one hand, there have been a transnational movement uh, instrumentalizing Islam and Islamic values and uh, trying to be active all around the world. But at the same time, inside the state structure, they are trying to reach the political power uh, all over the Turkey. Justice and Development Party between 2002 and 2013, or roughly we would say 2014, created a kind of an unconventional and informal uh, co collaboration or a coalition with the Gülen movement and created different kind of uh, state agencies all around the world, not only to show or to represent Turkey outside, the, outside the, uh, its territories, but also control serve the diasporas because Turkey realized that transnational state apparatus could be a very important tool to understand to to know and also to use the diaspora uh, structures as a kind of an outsider agency within this regards they established many different agencies some of these agencies for example the presence of the Turks abroad and related communities is much more cultural likewise the Yunus Emre Institute and also they created a TICA Turkish cooperation and coordination agency only I mean the building and constructing some of the uh, some of the uh, mosques or schools and all other stuff all around the world to, to, to serve the diasporas and also uh, Turkey's old and historical giant transnational state apparatus, presidency of the religious affairs, uh, supplying religious services to the diasporas. 
this period is a kind of a positive engagement period for diasporas. But after that, I mean, with the, with the increasing influence of this uh, gentleman, uh, as you can see in the uh, PowerPoint, uh, Professor Dr. Ahmed Damutoğlu, uh, former prime minister and the former foreign minister, and also a professor of the international relations, he created a kind of a new term and argued that now we are changing the, the term of diaspora. How he changed the term of diaspora? He claimed, he argued that not the Turkish citizens outside outside Turkey, but also, I mean, the Caucasus, the Balkans, the Albians, the Azeris, the other Turkic republics. That means that Muslims and the former Ottoman territories also considered as the Turkish diaspora. I mean, this is a very new dimension because we know that it is impossible to define these people as a diaspora according to the literature. But what the Turkish Turkey state under the Davutoglu, uh, Davutoglu's prime ministry and the uh, foreign minister tried to do that, combine the, uh, the terms of the soft power and the public diplomacy and representing the Turkish state, uh, not only for the Turkish diaspora, but also broader the line and including the uh, Muslims and also the former Ottoman Empire components. But after 2014, with the with the beginning of the interest-based clash and clash of the uh, between the Gulen movement and the Justice and Development Party, and the increasing uh, authoritarianism of Erdogan, and as a last point, uh, the 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 very questionable coup attempt, what we realized that there is a huge diasporization process started in the Turkey, who are who are like positioning themselves against the Erdogan's regime uh, in one way or another try to find themselves in the diaspora and this also changed the diaspora landscapes for Turkey and also this was the time uh, that we started to observe uh, observe the uh, the new dynamics of the diaspora management diaspora control for Turkey therefore our project's name is the new Turkey's new diaspora because the current justice and development party regime claim that there is a new Turkey and we claim that yes there is a new Turkey but at the same time this new Turkey is one of the main creator of this Turkish uh, the new Turkey originated diasporas I mean first of all what we saw that the 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 making and the remaking of the Turkish diaspora is a quite complicated issue because uh, when we compare the historical examples, what we know that the most of the Turkish diaspora members were not an, were not asylum seekers because we know the Kurds are the asylum seekers because of the uh, Turkish state's brutal activities against them. But right now, I mean, the Gulenists, the intellectuals, leftists, liberals, or it started to be an asylum seeker, uh, asylum seeker mostly in the Western countries, as you can from the graph I mean, the European Union, Germany, Greece, France, Netherlands, Switzerland. They are the main uh, hubs for this uh, asylum seeker uh, for for the new diasporas. I mean, because and also uh, because I mean these countries seems a kind of a democratic heaven and also these countries is also a kind of a meeting point where the where the old turkeys old diasporas and the new turkeys new diasporas can can uh, can can establish kind of a communication and the collaboration processes so in here what we can see i mean the next step of our research is the diaspora collaborations and the diaspora conflicts within these groups i mean the this is the one side of the point. The other side of the point, the new Turkey's new diasporas. What we can see that, okay, oh, uh, it's over, right? My, my process. Okay, I'll finish very quickly. I, I think I deserve two more minutes if you don't mind. Uh, the the as as you as you might remember that I mentioned about the uh, transnational state apparatus to serve the. Uh, Turkish diasporas. But right now, what we saw that the authoritarianism is not limited inside the Turkey. We saw that there is an extraterritorial authoritarianism uh, via transnational state apparatuses against the new Turkey's new diasporas. I mean, the Turkish uh, transnational state apparatus with the, co uh, with the collaboration of the Turkish intelligence services right now doing some operations uh, against the diasporas. 
And this is very important because, I mean, these are the kind of different operations. I mean, the confiscation, targeted violence, blah, blah, so on and so forth. This is also another important issue because, I mean, the, mostly the Turkish diasporas uh, reached the uh, host countries in, in previously as a, as, a, as a workers, as a migrants, as a middle class, as an upper middle class. But right now, what we saw that exportation of the domestic conflicts via transnational state apparatus. This is also quite relatively new processes. And also what we saw that the age limit is quite different and right now not only the younger generation has been migrating but also the mid, mid ages and the older generation is also uh, trying to become a diaspora because the being in a position of a uh, current Erdogan regime is a quite broader concept. And, uh, and but one last point, what is the importance of this country case for us, what we saw that there is a diversity within the diaspora. For example, the Gulenists, the member of the Gulen movement, has been asking some different issues from their host countries. But at the same time, upper middle class, who, they, who found that they don't have any bright feature in the Turkey, demanding something different from the host countries. Academics also uh, asking some different issues. I mean, try to conduct his, acad his or their academic researches in the foreign countries, but under the shadow of the Turkey state, it is quite different. So what we can say that right now, despite there is a, I mean, the, it seems that the Turkey is an authoritarian country in itself. No, it is not actually. It is, I mean, the issues, the problems, the questions, the disputes inside Turkey right now is in disputes of the United Kingdom, disputes of Germany, disputes of Sweden, via transnational state apparatus and via uh, exportation of the domestic conflicts in various ways. And this seems that the new Turkey's new diaspora is also kind of a diversity example for us, but at the same time, it is a security uh, security issue for all of us. One, my, my last sentence is, is that this is an interdisciplinary research forum. Within this diverse structure, I mean, to explain, to, exp to explain and to scrutinize these subjects, one discipline, which is the political science sub in diaspora studies, is not enough right now. International relations, diplomacy, foreign policy, and also security studies are very important to, secret, uh, to, to understand uh, or to capture a little bit of a photo of this complicated story. Thank you so much and thank you for your uh, patience uh, and give me an additional time. Now I'm stopping my screen sharing. Thank you so much for all. Thanks a lot, Ozzy. This was great. <clears throat> and thanks for, for keep, keeping to the time as well. So, so uh, our next uh, paper is by Alistair Ross, <clears throat> sorry, who is a professor of politics and education. And he will present a paper, Cohort Cohesion, Young Europeans' Constructions of Nationalism and Migration. So, Alistair, uh, are, you, are you sharing your presentation? I'm sharing my screen now. Great, great. Thank you. Yeah, we can, can see. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, and um, welcome to everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, young people and their understanding of nationalism and migration, um, how their experience of diaspora appears to contribute to their constructions of national identity, um, and I'm. My argument is essentially that migration from post-European, from uh, EU states from third countries is outside the European Union, has risen very significantly over the past two decades. Um, this has augmented previous migration of former colonial powers and uh, Germany to uh, in Germany from Turkey, but since the 1990s this has broadened and grown. Um, analysis now suggests that over 20% of all households in the European Union contain at least one person of non-EU origin or descent. And um, I'm going to examine the impact this has had on the ways in which young people construct their own identities, particularly as they relate to the idea of nation and nationalism, to migration and to racism. So my data comes from study of anything over the past decade of young people how they construct their political identity. Um, based on open-ended deliberative discussions with small groups, around six people at a time, between 12 and 19, mostly between 14 and 19, approximately equal number of males and females, half from middle families, half from working class families, um, 
from a variety of different settlements, from small towns to large cities, not just the capital cities. 16% of these were of non-EU descent or partial non-EU descent, and 4% were not born in the EU itself. Um, and I had colleagues in various cities and towns who helped me find schools, colleges, and places where I could actually conduct these interviews. Mostly of them were in English, with a translation in some of those were part of the part, of it, but mostly in English. And they lasted about an average 50 minutes. Some took as long as 100 minutes, not 100 hours. Um, this is where I did the work. Um, this is just gonna show you um, the number of places that I worked in. Uh, keep pressing the wrong key, oh, da, 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 sorry. Okay, so I began in the Eastern Union states that had joined the EU since 2004, and the Canadian countries in yellow. Um, and then uh, in 2014, I started on the older European Union members in the bright blue there, and the European Economic Area countries in the green. So um, in all, I covered um, three countries, um, about 2,000 young people in 324 groups. Um, this is the joys of being partly retired. You have time to do this sort of thing. Um, it's not a scale I'd recommend to anybody else. Um, deliberative discussion groups were my, my way of working. Um, Non-directed, open-ended discussions. I avoided giving categories. I followed up their observations, used their own language and terms, accepted what they said. I sought them disagreement amongst them, but didn't want them to come to a conclusion. I never introduced words like nation or state um, until and if it was introduced by one of them. I asked about their country, first of all, and if they said nation or country or state, I would then pick up on that term, what they meant by it. Um, I did not migration nor about racism. And they determined the terms and the focus of our discussions. A range of views, I can indicate the range and offer some generalizations. A typical question for me might be an opening example would be to ask, you know, the example of the Danish, Danish, Danish town of Slackelse, um, why are you Danish? And these are the kind of responses one would get from that. Um, and they would, Sometimes a national, but often they just talked about being Danish as being a feeling, and it's because you're born there, or because it's the culture you're grown up with, or not because you're born there, um, or because you've come to live there. Um, and you can see here, Dan that the young, these young Danish people in this small town, um, explaining that they've got different origins sometimes. Um, Janko is from Serbia, very clearly from Serbia, resolute in his Serbianness, the others all mixing various bits in, bits of German, so Croatian, and so on. Um, here's a conversation from Amsterdam with Hamid, a 17-year-old born in Afghanistan, who came to Amsterdam when he was 10 years old. And notice there, he says, being in London, there's nothing much. And nine minutes later, I ask about whether that Netherlands society they feel proud of. Micah mentions Amsterdam and images of prostitution and the like. But Hamid says also things that in the past, like slavery and war and the nation and that kind of thing. And the interesting thing is here is talking Hamid talking about things that we did in the past. He's identifying himself as being part of this community, being part of the society, being a Netherlander. Um, using we in a very natural way about the way he sees himself as being um, a Netherlander. There were competing constructions of why they thought um, they were attached to the country. They wouldn't define themselves by their nationality sometimes. This is a constructionist point of view. Um, it just means they're born in the country. Doesn't mean not very important about that. Your nationality that doesn't define who you are. Um, nationality is simply something we make up for ourselves. Others were much more essentialist about it. This is another mode of seeing how your nationality is. Um, I'm Serbian, this is in my blood. Um, Turkish example here, the Turkish person can sacrifice their life for their country, and the Turkish woman supports her man. 
Um, I'm doing because I was born here, but I'm also Moroccan. I never forget that Moroccan. So a variety of ways of thinking about other groups. And this, this way is a very essentialist way. It's something that's integral to your personality. And there's the ethnoculturalist view that um, we express our nationality through cultural terms. Um, this young boy in uh, young young man in Tokat in Turkey, been on a visit to Italy and was struck by the fact that Italians he thought weren't nationalists because they didn't show their flags very much. And any visit to Turkey will know that showing the flag there is very important. Um, an Italian correspondingly says culture is an element that characterizes a nation. And history sometimes makes you feel very nationalist. You have a cultural history you're, you're, and you're nationalist because the Turks conquered the country in the past from Romania. Um, and there's a cultural aspect of nationalism when you play another country in sport um, and in the Balkans, particularly playing the Serbians in football. Why do they have these different views? Well, older people may be nationalistic because they've lived in Denmark for a long time, they say. Um, and younger people say they're less nationalistic. Um, it's being attached to other, other aspects of the country. And sometimes it's used as a way of exploring a difference between yourself. Let's say it was often mentioned um, as a way of differentiating Europeanness from being um, from having a characteristic is different from the USA. And similarly with Russians, Russia is seen as being very conservative and nationalistic, unlike us. I'm anti-nationalists, say some of them, quite a few of them. I don't like to actually say that they're actually attached to a nation in some of them. So those convergent explanations. Now, I want to very quickly run through some of the things they said about race and about ethnicity, and they're att particularly attached to the, the time they did the work in these countries. This is the period 14 to 16. Um, in those countries, the other arrows show, show when I was in the countries, and then in the, in the months corresponding to the years. And um, what was going on outside that they referred to a lot, the, state, the formation of Daesh, Charlie Hebdo, the Copenhagen Synagogue killings, a hundred killing in Ankara and the Bataclan. All these points were referred to and colored their views, as did this, the great migration from Europe, from Syria that took place um, via both Italy and via Greece. And those are the numbers per month in the times I was there. And all these got picked up on as part of the reference to their talk about their identity with their country. Early on, this is back in October 2014, before this much of this started, they were complaining about the racism of their parents, making racist jokes and other people being racist. Um, and concern about immigrants and concern about people who are concerned about immigrants. Um, now, January, Austria, just after Charlie Hebdo, and freedom of speech becomes important. This has happened in France and everyone is going on, my God, to fight for that, but no one said yes, there's also freedom of religion. And the Charlie Hebdo demonstrations, the European leaders coming together, also referred to by Agatha here in Innsbruck, um, everyone in Europe coming together, a very important value for human human rights, for Europe, human rights. Erta in Honebekton in Sweden, in Switzerland, other European nations helped France and also references to what's going on locally, the um, political parties in Switzerland that were, the, that were, national, were nationalistic, were racist. And Italy, in the, in the next month, referring again to the Charlie Hebdo incidents and making them feel either European or feeling human because of these events. In Belgium, a few months later, um, these young people in Brussels, most of whom were multicultural school and from um, various countries other than, uh, than Belgium, um, seeing the advantage of multiculturalism in a large city and seeing the way in which um, the media 
were distorting sometimes the view that they had of other countries and particularly of Muslims. Um, young Muslims here in Belgium um, talking about the scarf, the ban, on, the ban on the scarves that was going on at that time and the comparing that with, with the, the, the Christian sisters, the nuns who were dressed in very similar ways and wondering why that was perfectly okay. Um, but there were also racist events. This is a small town in the north in, in, of Belgium. Um, close the borders. How do they, they're changing our culture. That's not why should, they should do things. How do they change their culture? They want to build their mosque on our grounds. Um, how does that change your culture, I asked? Because we have a normal Christian church and they want to build their own mosque in the middle of our cities. And I argued a bit. I said, you had colonies, you built churches there. What's the difference? And this is a very grandiloquent colonialist viewpoint. We had the right to do so because they were our colonies. That was an exception, but it did happen. Um, and these are young um, Muslim kids in Nantes, in France, in May, um, and feeling discriminated against and feeling that they were being held up as responsible for everything because they were Muslim. Interesting contrast here, this is in Lille. Pascaline used to be in the countryside and then was quite prejudiced, she felt. They were evil people. We never saw people from Maghreb. Blaise, born and raised in the city. A total opposite. Couldn't be further from what Pascaline said. Minority people were not of migration backgrounds here. And in um, Hubei, which is the poorest commune in France, most, most deprived, these are all migrant origin young people talking about the hypocrisy of France, talking about being Francais de Souche, French by roots, as opposed to them who are only Francais de Papier, um, and feeling very much put upon the racism around them. And then we had the incidents, the walls going up in Hungary, the deaths and these photographs being all over the place and an intensification of the way in which people started talking about migration, the problem of Syrian migration, the closing of the borders. It's strange that would have hurt them on their friend. Um, and here, a very small town, a very small village, in fact, in southern France, um, people being seeing the prejudice around them, people seeing that Europe is one thing, but things in Hungary aren't the same. A unity is destroyed. Hungary is not respecting the principles. Um, and Hungary got picked up here a lot, both in France after that and in, in, in Montpellier, the town there. Um, reference again to Charlie Hebdo and in Spain at the end of the same month um, the wars with Syria coming to Europe uh, bringing people to Europe proud of being European because of the response the refugees the European community needed there to stop people sending the sending them all back and references here both to the past Sancho here referring to refugees in the civil war um, in Spain and that historic memory helps him build up a positive picture towards refugees and Santi watching TV this morning the mayor of Calais entered the refugee camp and told the refugees to the cities so both very contemporary daily events influencing them and also that cultural history of problems in the past in their own country and here almost there Svetlana um, feeling European for um, many reasons, but also the Hungarian incident. I'm going to slip, slip over that, very quickly refer to Germany. Petros here, a German my immigrant origin, um, from uh, he, he was from Greece, and they tended to be a little bit more cautious about immigrants um, taking place. But for other young Germans here in Germany, what was formerly Germany enforced little village on the frontier. Um, referring to family experiences, sister's boyfriend, my mother telling me it was wonderful to see what was going on and she was helping them. And refugee uh, offer, explanations offered for why Germany accepted refugees so willingly, again referring back to the past. Refugees um, 
in the 1945 period, post-war, when we often forget some 10, 11 million German refugees arriving in Germany, and that being a very important part of the culture um, that they remembered had happened to them and made them very aware it was a good thing to accept refugees now. So I want to suggest here we're getting a new cohort of young people. Um, Charles here says very clearly, as the other young body before, I moved to the city quite recently and I, my prejudices I've left behind because I've grown up now with people who are from this wide variety of backgrounds. And this is the showing of the way in which those backgrounds change. This is the ages of the cohort in the school I study. This is the cohort of their parents and of their grandparents. And you can see here the rise, the rise in number of people of migrant origin in the country and Europe over that period. Now, I'm saying just this is a cohort. A cohort has a political identity that endures. And it can be a very powerful way of studying changes in social constructs. And it's been done a lot in Germany with papers called Fulbrook. And I'm using the word cohort here to show something particular. The difference between cohort and the generation. An age effect is when something, something happens when you get older. So as you get older, from young person to older, you change in various ways. You, you, know, you get down to here, your hair starts falling out and so on, if you're a man. And politically, it's said that you know, young people vote with their heart when they're 20 and when they're the wallet when they're 50. Um, a period effect is different. A period effect is a major social event that affects everybody. It could be a war, it could be a pandemic. And that affects everybody. They all get changed as a result of what happens as a result of a period effect. A cohort effect is rather different. A cohort, cohort effect affects simply people of a particular age when they're developing their political identities. So a cohort effect, for example, affects only the people who are younger or largely the people who are younger. And I want to suggest that the change in the demography of Europe over the past 20 years has produced a cohort effect in young people, which makes them much more receptive and involved in a different view of their country that's not nationalistic, that's accepting and tolerant of diversity and diaspora. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, um, Alistair. This is a fascinating presentation and a brilliant PowerPoint, I must say. We have a lot, a lot to learn from you in many ways. So, so the next uh, speaker is uh, Gordana Uzi, let's, uh, Gordana is a senior lecturer uh, at, uh, in sociology at London Metropolitan University, and uh, she will present a paper, Rhetorics of Economic Nationalism, Bargaining with Migrants. So, Gordana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Thank you very much, uh, everyone who was here. I'm glad to see uh, you had nothing better to do uh, today. Um, just to open my screen, I hope you can see uh, my presentation. <clears throat> this presentation is based on my current research on economic nationalism. And in this presentation, I will actually uh, concern or be concerned more with the point of view of the host nation rather than migrants. Um, but in any case, I will start uh, this presentation with a rather bold claim. I will start with the claim that in the last years, Britain is experiencing a shift of its dominant ideology, a shift from neoliberalism to economic nationalism. In this presentation, I will try to analyze the main structure of this new dominant ideological narrative by focusing on um, the role of immigration. Of course, it is obvious that Britain today could not be further from any notion of uh, ideological unity, quite the contrary. But this presentation will claim that how diverse some ideological narratives seem to be on their normative level, the level of uh, prescribed morality and values. Um, they are much closer on their operative level, uh, the level of prescribed social action. To achieve this, I will start from the head. 
I will examine ideological narratives offered by Boris Johnson and Nicola Sturgeon. And uh, from the outset, uh, it might be difficult to think of other politicians that are so routinely placed on the opposite side of the uh, political spectrum. So with this aim, I focus my analysis on um, times when these narratives were most clearly formulated. That would be for Boris Johnson, the period of Brexit campaign, and I bet you missed talking about Brexit. And uh, from Nicola Sturgeon, it is the aftermath of the uh, Brexit referendum until uh, her uh, well, uh, general elections in 2017. Um, the data consists for Boris Johnson overall about 25 different writings or speeches. That's about how much I could stomach. And about 33 speeches uh, of Nicola Sturgeon in a Scottish Parliament and so on. So um, let's first start with this analysis. Looks like Cordana's just dropped out of the session temporarily. I can see that she's just reconnecting. Okay. Well, hopefully she 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 will be with us in a couple of minutes. Okay. Perhaps, perhaps we should move on and come back to her. Yeah, um, I, I think so. I think so. So, so I guess uh, maybe if uh, if Don c could uh, proceed with his presentation, uh, and then we'll have Godana. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. So, 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 mm -hmm. so, 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 so. Uh, uh, our next speaker, while we wait for good Donna, is uh, Professor Don McReel, who, who will present reflections on diasporas and transnationalism. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess I'm just trying to. Um, oh, it looks like my connection's too poor to share anything. Do you know what? I think my might, might have been Godana's problem, so I think I'll just uh, give you a paper. How does that sound? I think it's perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, okay. okay, so what I'm going to talk about then is indeed the limitations of them and some musings of uh, transnationalism. This is based on nation things work I've done in the past. A couple of books I wrote as part of projects. Um, and and also um, something I'd like to do in in the future, and that's to basically explore the idea of the British world as a series of interconnected associations. To look so to look at the British world as an associational world, and, and in quite a broad ranging way, uh, diaspora can be seen and measured according to certain principles. Historian, I'm not interested in just theorising liminal space, as important as that is, uh, and I obviously. The theorist who's better than me, a sociologist and anthropologist, because of course one needs this. But I'm interested in international communication. That's the thing that has inspired me to think about the global Irish first of all, and the global English. Uh, and I guess, in a way, part of the game to raise the question of the uh, of the English diaspora. I've written an entire book on that, so perhaps. Uh, Pretty big parlor game. Um, we all know that during the 19th century, the mass migration took millions of people to the New World, principally to the US, other parts of the English speaking world. And I think that's also the, that's immediately uh, one of the important dichotomies that the United States is a very different 
from the English colonies. It certainly is for the Irish. It's difficult to be radical Irish nationalist in, whilst the British are watching you, to do it, whilst the Americans are turning their backs. Now, one of the things that I've explored before, which would be the springboard for a much larger project globally of collaborative effort, is the of associations and associational culture, um, the ways in which uh, migrants form societies, club societies, German Vereine, and all kinds of others, every, every nation that sent people to the United States uh, or to other parts of the world formed these national associations. They were named for saints, they were named for Hermann in the German case in terms of Arminius's victory over the, over the Romans at the uh, Teutoburg Forest in AD 9. Yes, the Germans sound very much like other romantic nationalists or the increasingly um, bellicose nationalists in the 19th century. Then the English aren't far behind in their celebrations of Nelson, of, um, of, of Bodicea, of, of Queen, Good Queen Bess, and all kinds of other symbols of the nation. And we could talk forever about just the symbols of the nation as they went abroad. But what I'm interested in is the sort of structure of a series of societies uh, named for St. George, named for England, which uh, provide, first of all, a sense of responsibility, just like you find at home amongst middle class uh, English uh, settlers, and then degrees of charity towards the poor who lie beneath them, or indeed radically independent benevolence by uh, English, just like German or Scots or any others, but by radical English and, or, or uh, working class English uh, workers who wish to form benevolent societies so that they never need to fall on charity, the idea of the friendly society, but with a, an ethnic twist in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, etc. So we have this sort of quite interesting um, um, mosaic of different organisations in a world in the 19th century when people formed dizzying arrays of these organisations. Of course, one of the problems with the English uh, is de defining them as ethnic at all. There's very little interest in them in the in the literature. Even those who have uh, made a living out of writing about the English, looking at their letters, looking at their patterns of settlement, tend to see them through prisms and ethnicity. They tend to see uh, you know, many of the markers that I would consider to be ethnic, in which anyone would see as ethnic by the Irish or the Scots, uh, for some reason aren't considered ethnic by the English. Why is this? Because the English are seen as the as part of that foundational Anglo culture, they're largely seen as Protestant, aligned with WASP Americans against uh, groups of immigrants. And I think, you know, to, to some extent, in fact, to a significant extent, that is reasonable. It's also true that when the English express themselves in public, they they look imperial. They are declaring their loyalty to the Queen. They are celebrating her various uh, diamond jubilees when the Boer War comes along in 1819 and uh, 1899 uh, you know the English are pretty bellicose in celebrating that and and, and raising money for it sending sending uh, funds to uh, the widows of, of Boer War troops and whatnot in back in England um, I think the Boer was an interesting uh, point actually because it really shows the divide between an increasingly large and present and active Irish nationalist uh, diaspora. I mean, one strand of the diaspora, not everything about the Irish abroad is nationalist and political. Uh, but you see the getting towards a high peak of a global struggle against uh, British rule in Ireland and set that against what is essentially an Anglo world global war in which, a uh, civil war in which uh, Australians, New Zealanders, um, English South Africans, or at least non Boer South Africans, Canadians fight against the Boers and actually Irish, English, uh, sorry, Irish, English, some English anyway, German, Scots, Irish, um, uh, most Europeans, Utlander fight actually against against the English for, for the Boers. I mean, I mean, they're not large in number, but there's quite a lot of that. So you get this split going on, which re represents really the larger story of geopolitics in the world. Anyway, the one of the interesting things about um, immigrant ethnic associationalism in 19th century America is that whilst I've just talked really about charity and benevolence and collective self-help and the way in which groups cl club together um, and actually as a means of settling into American or other society, and it does seem 
slightly curious that being more German for a spell might be good leverage for becoming an American, but it is true because, of course, when you arrive on your own as an individual, you develop this ethnic sense and gradually over a period of time and through the generations, that transmogrifies into a different sort of hyphenated Americanism, which we've all seen in our favorite movies. Uh, but, you know, as it, these organizations are a good way for people to leverage some room in these very busy cosmopolitan and um, you know ethnic mosaics in, in big American cities and, and not just in America, elsewhere too. Now the there's a noticeable rise in a more militant sort of ethnic organization in 1840s America, which is resistant to um, resistant to the the rise of American nativism, and this is also a, a, something which I think dissipates uh, claims to English. Ethnic, uh, ethnicity or English diasporic consciousness because Germans and Irish form societies which are essentially self-defense organizations against increasing hostility to immigrants but particularly to Catholic immigrants because the Germans like the Irish were, were not entirely in, in this case but significantly Catholic too they were Catholic and Jewish as well as Lutheran and so you have these societies, particularly the society I told you about, the name I mentioned before, named for Hermann, uh, the Society of the, the Brethren of Hermann, which is a great name. Uh, very, very strong, very large organization, which was really exclusively aimed at forwarding the German case, bringing Germans together, defending them against the, some quite vicious political campaigning and some physical violence as well. So, so then we have these sort of different layers of ethnicity. We have these different markers of ethnicity and this different national ethnicities. But what we have commonly are a series of performances, a series of expressions which are common to all the groups, the English no less than the others. And one of the lessons that one must take away from you know, consideration of these topics is that it's really the bleeding between English and British and between English identity and imperial identity, which makes the English different to say the Germans or to or to the um, or, or to say the Irish, you know, who have a different sort of. But in, in terms of actual performance, in terms of actual organisation, in terms of other things, um, in the daily activity and the, and the sorts of things they do, they are they are very similar. Is my is my time nearly up? Is that what I'm saying? Is that what I'm saying? You, you you have a couple of minutes more. I do. I, I, I didn't think of any more. It's never any more than a couple of minutes when I start to think I'm near my end. <laughs> so okay. in terms of, of, of where I'm going with this now, um, I mean, I've already gone some of the distance looking at uh, the Irish before, the English before, is to actually see, I see transnationalism as a methodology. Not everyone would agree with that. Perhaps no one would agree with that. But I see it as a methodology in the sense that I'm looking for interconnections between ethnic communities, however you want to measure those, let's just call them Irish, English, Scottish, just for now, whatever, Russian, throw them all in there. I'm looking for connections between those communities within new national settings, so yes, within America, but actually between nations across the parallel, the foreign parallel to Canada, and also globally. And all, you know, all of the immigrants from the British and Irish Isles measure up to that test you find communication between the Sons of England, an organization founded in 1870s Canada, which spreads to South Africa, but never to England or anywhere else. So clearly some Canadian on migration, probably of minors, goes to, goes, to, uh, goes to South Africa and maintains this connection. Uh, trade unions emerge from London and other Manchester and other places. They spread around the world. And it's only after 20 years, 30 years, that they transmogrify into non-English trade unions and no longer answer to the imperial homeland. They break away and become something different, often rename themselves the Amalgamated Society of Engineers, the Cooperative Movement, the Odd Fellows, one of the world's biggest um, friendly societies, the Foresters, all these organizations do this. They globalize, they maintain communication, and then the way that you see some of the movements through Alistair's paper between generations, not wishing to mix up generations, cohorts and, and others, uh, that you, you see these changes from a sort of dependence, equality, 
to to independence but you also see circular the, the circularizing of ideas around the world the circulation of ideas around the world without any reference to the english at home should home form their organizations which go abroad but the, those abroad also communicate without any regard to 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 the homeland so and i think that's an, an important measure of of diaspora not not i mean obviously what what Erdi tell, tells us about with the connections to Turkey and the way Turkish politics refracts through the diaspora. You see that in the case of the Boer on Boer on the English and the further division between Scots, Irish and English, of course. But actually you also see organizations communicating their ethnicity between uh, between imperial out, outposts, between colonies, not just back, backwards and forwards to the homeland. So, um, so I'm very interested in finding evidence of these connections. They often come through the movements of individuals, they come through the uh, movements of associations, and they come through the, the movement of ideas and of influence through news media, through popular books, through pamphlets and all kinds of other things. So there's a literature of this, there is an association of this, and there are kind of prominent individuals. And I'll finish just with one one story uh, very quickly because there's at least one architect in the room. There's an architect called Edmund Lind who was born in Islington in the mid 19th century. I can't remember exactly when. Um, he goes to he goes to Baltimore. He joins the uh, the St George's Society there. He becomes an office holder. Does all of his good middle class duty, but he also um, designs. He is the architect for the Peabody Library which is Johns Hopkins' magnificent library. And, and he also builds, you know, he's responsible for designing and building lots of, lots of places in, in the south of some states in Georgia, Atlanta and whatnot. So, you, you know, every story about the English or the Irish is framed by people like this, people who actually, um, people who actually represent the diaspora in flesh and blood. So the individual, the association, and we see there the individual intersecting with the association and we could build a magnificent prosopography, a collective biography of those kinds of, uh, of, of people. And those kinds of people and their kinds of associations, you know, they require theorizing, they require different methodologies and they require such an effort because their records are all over the world. And, you know, the records as you go to the 20th century become different, become wider ranging and, and, in, and in different formats. They're not just dusty old historical archives. Right, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Don. It's a really wonderful, <laughs> wonderful area to research. Uh, and now I hope we have uh, we have Gordana. Gordana, are you with us? Um, I think you are here. I can see you. I'm here. I'm really sorry. I have great, a great. No, no. Welcome back. So, so if you could just uh, uh, resume from where you stopped. Can you can you upload your your, your screen? Hmm. Gordon, are you with us? I think we're connecting again. I think we maybe have trouble with our internet connection. Right. Mm. Okay. Well, in this case, I guess. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I will. Sorry about that. I will try again. And and okay. my if it doesn't work, what can we do? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, let, let, let's try again. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, I apologize again, everyone, for this. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't work again, and uh, let's see. Um, so, here we are. Uh, can you see it, uh, my screen? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, I'm really sorry for this. Um, 
My presentation is based on my current research on economic nationalism, but um, it focuses more uh, on the perspective of the host nation rather than migrants themselves. Um, I will start uh, this presentation with a bold uh, claim uh, and say that in the last years, Britain is experiencing a sh shift of its dominant ideology, a shift from neoliberalism to economic nationalism. In this presentation, I will try to analyze the main structure of this dominant ideological narrative by focusing on the role of integration. Of course, it is obvious that uh, Britain today could not be further from any notion of ideological unity, quite the contrary. But this presentation will claim that however diverse some ideological narrative seems to be on their normative level, or the level of uh, prescribed morality and values, uh, they are much closer on their operative level, the level of prescribed social action. So to achieve this, I will uh, start from the head. I will examine ideological narratives offered by Boris Johnson and Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, from the outset, it is difficult to think about um, politicians that are so routinely placed on the opposite side of political spectrum. So with this aim, I focus my analysis on times when these narratives were most clearly formulated. That would be the uh, so-called Brexit referendum campaign of 2016, and I'm sure you missed talking about Brexit, for Boris Johnson and uh, the aftermath of the referendum right about uh, until a 2017 election for Nicola Sturgeon. So data set uh, consists uh, of Boris Johnson consists about 25 speeches and mostly writings in the Telegraph and so on. That's about how much I could stomach. And about 33 speeches uh, in the Scottish Parliament, events and press conferences for uh, Nicola Sturgeon. So uh, let's start with uh, the basic analysis of the most frequent terms in their uh, writings and speeches. So let's start with uh, Johnson, the main uh, and most frequent term is definitely the people, and that leads the table. The second most frequent term is unsurprisingly word control. Uh, what is for me surprising is that uh, on the ninth place of most uh, frequent uses of word, word integration, uh, he uses in average uh, about five times per Sturgeon, the clear winner is uh, words Scotland or term. On average, Sturgeon uses some form of term Scotland or Scottish uh, 36 times per speech. Cluster analysis indicates the main themes in her speeches, uh, interests of Scotland and Scottish people, of course, a, a, a Scottish economy and the single market issues related to the problems of Brexit. Uh, at first, it uh, might seem that the issue of immigration does not pay, play an important role in her ideological narrative, but we will soon see how the issue of immigration is tightly intertwined with uh, Scottish interests. So uh, let's put these terms in a context. Closer thematic analysis reveals Johnson's three main aspects of immigration. Immigration as a strain on public services, immigration as a cause of uncontrolled crime, and immigration's impact on wages. More and more people, Johnson says, will exercise their unfettered rights to come to this country, putting more pressure on our public services. Johnson tends to use these big numbers and statistics pulled out of the context of his writings to convey that immigration in the main, is the main reason for falling public services, especially NHS. I'm quite sure you are all well aware of that. The second theme portrays freedom of movement as um, a sign welcoming terrorists to Europe and directly accuses Europe of preventing Britain to deport foreign uh, criminals, implying that immigration directly threatens the safety of British uh, people. Finally, in Johnson's right, immigration is one of the main factors that impacts wages, um, therefore standard of living, 
of the British people, but not everyone, not as he calls them, FTSE 100 chiefs. And we'll come back to this issue a little bit later. For now, as we know, the solution for her, in his view uh, to these issues is taking back control of our borders. His ideological narrative tells us that the regulation of borders means regulation of wages and inequality, crime, and better public services, or something like that. Before we engage with his argument further, uh, let us now look at how integration is addressed in Nicholas Sturgeon's speeches. I found this word tree quite telling. Uh, in Sturgeon's speeches, the word welcome uh, is associated, is mostly associated with issues of, of immigration, is, if you can see, like in rem, uh, you remain welcome here, Scotland is your home. I'm sure most of us would look at this and think, now that's more like it. But let us examine more closely ways in which the topic of immigration is dealt with in her speeches. Here again, I identified three main themes. Immigration as a solution to the demographic issue, contribution of migrants to knowledge and innovation, and benefits of immigration for the Scottish economy. Since, as she says, Scotland has had uh, the fourth lowest rate of population growth, okay, um, for her, any kind of uh, Immigration is crucial for maintaining the living standard and public services. So any restriction of this flow of immigrants uh, directly endangers well-being of Scottish people. Sturgeon proudly and I have to say repeatedly reports that apart from Luxembourg, Scotland has uh, more world-class universities per head of population than any other country in the world where, as you can see, one-sixth of the academic staff are EU citizens. This is a very important issue for Sturgeon, since uh, she sees innovation and technology as one of the main fields where Scotland, Scottish economy can prosper. Finally, and most commonly, Sturgeon talks about the multitude of ways in which immigration benefits the Scottish economy as a whole. And that is why, as she says, the UK government's approach to Brexit is so infuriating. It is abandoning something that Scotland's economy benefits hugely from, our membership of the single market, in order to restrict something else which Scotland's economy really needs, freedom of movements for EU workers. So what is the solution for that infuriating problem? She says, that's why we are now arguing for immigration powers to be devolved to Scotland. Or to put it in other words, Sturgeon proposes taking control of our borders. Therefore, when we compare arguments of Johnson and Sturgeon on issues of immigration, on the normative level, they cannot be more diverse. But on the operative level, their ideologies show indicative similarities. They both base their arguments on certain myths of migration, whether it's that a uh, myth of immigration which lowers wages, or myth that illegal immigration can be controlled, or that immigration can save us from the consequences of aging population. But there is more to it. Both ideological narratives predominantly refer to the issue of immigration in terms of cost-benefit ratio. What is in it for us? There is an evident lack of discussion on immigration as a humanitarian or human right issue, political or cultural one. As such, both of these narratives can easily be perceived as rationalization and economization of migrants. And therefore, they can easily dismiss any kind of accusation of exploitation, xenophobia, or racism. Uh, finally, uh, whether we agree with Johnson or Sturgeon, or neither of them, we accept this discourse as normal, as a generalizing issue of immigration from an economic standpoint. And if we stop our analysis at this level, this would be, for me, just touching the surface of the problem. Once that we identify similarities in this operative level of ideological narrative, we have to ask why. 
why is this similarity appearing? The answer to this question, in my view, is best exemplified in two quotes, and I will start with one from Boris Johnson. He writes, so what is it that these fat cats like about the EU? Broadly, he says two things. They like uncontrolled immigration because it helps to keep wages down at the bottom end and so to control costs and therefore to ensure that it's even more dosh for those at the top. A steady supply of hardworking immigrant labor means they don't have to worry quite so much about the skills or uh, aspirations or self-confidence of young people growing up in this country. In this quote, Johnson brings into direct relations uh, uncontrolled immigration and so-called fat cats. So who were the fat cats? Those are the city business leaders, the lobbyists, FTSE 100, American presidents, if you remember Obama endorsed a Remain campaign, and the people who were responsible, actually here what's missing is a 2008 crash. Remember also the same of those who profit for immigration and low wages. Here, Johnson is creating a social division between Britain of fat cats, the investment banking and multinational corporations, and the rest, the Britain of small businesses and entrepreneurs that Johnson calls backbone of the economy. This is an ideology that paints a picture of a runaway economy, the economy that only serves <clears throat> the interests of the few, uh, but not of the nation as a whole. This is a picture of what Karl Polanyi would call this embedded economy. Uh, so this type of ideology demands that the national economy is imbued again with national values and that it should serve national interests, even if that means loss of wealth and gains. Taking back control of borders, laws, and the economy as a whole is the offered solution. And this ideology calls for re-embedding of the national economy into national fabric. Is the this ideological narrative of Nicola Sturgeon different? And this is the second uh, quote uh, that I mentioned. She says, although, although immigration brings significant economic benefits, these benefits aren't felt by everyone. So, it will become even more important to ensure that economy works more effectively for people who are currently unemployed and on low wages. Sturgeon is also aware, obviously, of the social polarization that immigration brings. She can see, just like Johnson, that not all are benefiting from the current economic situation. However, her emphasis is different. The logic of Johnson implies that if immigration does not benefit all, we should abolish immigration. Sturgeon claims, if immigration does not benefit all, then we should redistribute those benefits better. She advocates the so-called open economy that is based on inclusive growth. For her, an open economy means a welcoming society where the growth should benefit individuals and communities across the country. She calls this a fair society. This fair society is inclusive and welcoming. It is prosperous and sustainable, but also, if you can see, it is something to be built yet, something that is a project for a future. This is an ideological narrative that promises an embedded economy, the economy that works for the nation, not the nation that works for the economy. That is another normative difference between Johnson and Sturgeon's ideological narratives. While well, one points at those who are to be blamed for all the troubles of the people, the other offers a vision of a society that will work for the people. But on the operative level, they both face an obstacle, dependence on supranational forces. So Johnson demands regaining sovereignty from the EU and Sturgeon demands independence from the UK because only then they both will control their own destiny. Finally, I cannot but see both of these 
ideological narratives as forms of economic nationalism. Economic nationalism is an ideology that tries to see this uh, national economy imbued with national values and ideals. The economy is seen as it should be embedded within the national community in the same way as uh, its culture and politics are. The economy should be defined and most importantly felt as national or as our own. For Johnson, that would be the economy of small businesses and entrepreneurs and for Sturgeon, an open economy based on inclusive growth. These ideologies are forms of nationalism that define most of the major national problems through the economic spectrum. Issues of social justice or lack of it, crime, a loss of national character, and as we have seen of immigration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Godana. It's, uh absolutely fascinating very, very very important piece of work i i, I feel um, now uh, i suggest that we move to questions and answers and and then at the end uh, perhaps we will dedicate some time to to discussing the way forward so if you have questions can you indicate uh, in in the bubble um that you just say, I have a question, and uh, I, I will call you. Or you can write the question in the bubble itself, I, I can read it for you. Um, yeah, <laughs> pleased to see that we now have some collaborations all forming. Uh, yeah. Um, maybe, maybe while, while people are uh, are, are thinking, I, I would like to ask a question. Uh, okay, just a quick. Diana question. has a question. Yeah. Okay. So, so Diana, do, do you want to ask the question, or should I read it for you? Uh, okay. So Diana has a has. A, has a question uh, for, for for the panelists. So f fascinating presentation from all speakers, really and truly inspiring. Yeah, I agree. I have a question for the panel. Uh, so uh, recently, the first minister of Wales has come under fire for saying that nationalism is an inherently right-wing creed that operates by persuading people that they, that they are uh, because they are. Um, against what somebody else is. Within the context of increased tensions between British English, Unionist nationalism and Celtic nationalism, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, in the UK, what is your prediction for the future of the Union and which type of nationalism will prevail? And is Drake Ford's remark ill thought? Um, okay. Um, so, so, so um let's uh perhaps start well i was alistair alistair do you have any thoughts about this yeah i think this is one of the problems around identity politics is that many people seem to seek a singular identity particularly of this essentialist nature that um it believes that it's, it's an inheritance that you belong to a nation and that's the essentialist view of a nation is that um it's something it's it's, it's embodied in you in that way and that it's exclusionary and therefore it runs counter to the idea that you can have multiple identities that you can be, you can have a, a variety of different identities that you express at different times in different ways depending on the context it's contingent um, one of the problems is increasingly that more and more people in the United Kingdom and elsewhere uh, have a multitude of inheritances um, and of fairly recent origin. Um, looking at the school population of the UK, for example, from about 2000 onwards, the increasingly dominant ethnic group has been those of mixed origins. Um, 
we and it, it it began in essentially the home counties when about that time when we began to get people from minority groups moving out of London and settling in in the home counties and very quickly we got a whole host of young kids in schools who um were of mixed origin various mixed origins um and that's increased over the last 20 years so a lot of people increasing number of people especially people coming up to beginning to start their career as a a, a political beings with a vote um, have origins that are not nationalist in that way. Um, okay. That's going to create tensions with an older generation who very much think them think of themselves have this mythical belief in themselves as being genetically um, pure nationalist nation of English national origin. Okay, thanks, Alistair. Now, uh, Ozzy and then Gordana. Uh, well, thank you so much, Svetlana. I mean, I would like follow the uh, footstep of Alistair, but I can think the, I would not say anything about the future of the Union, but I think the First Minister of Welsh is quite wrong regarding the, the and an inheriting of the nationalism from the right wing. I mean, it doesn't mean that as the political scientists, we know that it doesn't mean that if you're a social democrat or a sociologist, you should be an internationalist. No. For example, I mean, the most of the South South uh, nations or the in the Middle East, I mean, the nationalism at, at the same time means to save the country and the uh, independence independence and the nationalist is then overlapping each other. So that doesn't mean that the right wing is always following the nationalism. I mean, nationalism is a kind of a normative uh, apparatus that feeding the uh, political ideologies and it can be a political ideology in itself. So you can be a leftist and the nationalist, you can be a feminist and a nationalist, you can be a social democrat and nationalist. I mean, nationalism is something different. And we know that from Andrew Haywood, <clears throat> from Scott Appleby, I mean, these are the huge literatures about the nationalism and the varieties of nationalism and the theories of nationalism. So this 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 uh, this issue is a little bit uh, problematic if we consider that every kind of nationalism is coming from a right-wing political parties. It would be very hard for us to read the different to read the current different type of uh, nationalism and the the relations, the linear and the vertical relations within the same nationalist group. So it's a little bit of a complicated issue. This is what I would say, and in terms of theoretical point of view. Thanks so much, uh, Gordana. Did you want to add something? Yes, thank you. Um, I think that uh, linking uh, nationalism to right wing is uh, mostly connected to a particular vision of what nationalism is, as Erdi was, an analyst there was talking about. We have here in Britain quite kind of, a, a dumb, I don't know, a usual notion of nationalism as uh, ethnic nationalism, as something that counts uh, red or whatever, blood cells, something that looks at uh, genes and things like that. Nationalism has its own civic uh, face as well. And uh, that was interesting for me when I started to look at uh, British nationalism to see how, to which extent, certain nationalistic claims are normalized, as I wanted to say, or what Billig would call how nationalism in Britain in all groups became banal every day. So I think that uh, looking at nationalism only as uh, one where, you know, boost your chests and go on the uh, streets and wave flags. Uh, would be a very much reductionist view on what nationalism is. Effectively, we, in quite kind of dominant political discourse, we, are, uh, we already accepted, normalized this vocabulary and rhetorics of nationalism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any, any, any more people who would like uh, to ask a question? Um, can, can I, I, I Yes, please. Uh, Sorry, I Jan. might uh, just offer a, offer a comment for uh, yes, uh, Piana there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm an historian and the future isn't my period, so I, I don't know what will happen to the, um, to, to, the, to the union, but I think it's probably, uh, it's, it's going to be put under severe, an even more severe stress test at <sighs> some point. But it, it, but it is, it is strangely quite strong and durable for all manner of reasons. I think that, um, 
you know, there, there is right wing nationalism, there is left wing nationalism in Ireland, though it doesn't often look very, very left wing when, you know, it, you know, it depends what you're doing on the number of nationalism. It's certainly identities, uh, you can wear many different identities, as Erdi alluded to. This primordial nationalism that where you that where you can only have be of a nation if you have a biological connection to it, which I think is a bit of refer, referred to. But you know, Anthony Smith has written a lot about that, uh, and I think some some peoples, particularly in the UK context, are very close together uh, in, in in by any definition of origins, but very but very far apart in terms of how they see themselves through ethnic and national identifiers, what uh, Sigmund Freud would call the narcissism of small differences. You know, I think there's, a, there's something in that too. Um, but nationalism is a very broad church. It goes through different phases. In the 19th century, it seems heroic. In the 20th, early 20th century, it seems destructive. Uh, now, it seems destructive to me um, when it's been posed, the economic nationalism, which I was very convinced by from, from, from uh, Godana there, when that is being imposed from London upon the rest of the Isles, then their nationalism uh, in resistance to it seems more virtuous. So it's interesting, you know, Wales voted for, uh, for for Brexit, go figure. Anyway, I should probably stop rambling now, but yeah, a very, very interesting question actually. Too difficult to answer here in one go, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, thanks. And, and also, just, just one sentence, if you don't mind, we shouldn't uh, mix the, the real nationalism and the current banal nationalism, which has been combination with the populism. I mean, the banal nationalism, which with the coin of the Michael Billings, is the one of the common nationalism all around the world right now under the shadow of the populism. So we should also think about that while we are uh, thinking about nationalism. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can I come in and ask a question? Yes, but please. Yes, yes, please. Yes, Jan. Yeah, um, thank you, Alistair. I, I think that um, some of your findings have chimed with some of the work I've done on cosmopolitanism in higher education, particularly in urban communities where you can see students see, see themselves in a sort of multi-layered identity uh, and um, have a much more um empathetic approach to sort of common humanity as opposed to seeing themselves in a in a, in a strong national identity context and and um i think i think it's um something that 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 needs to be taken forward for me in an educational context to understand more about that but my question was more more in line with um and it's sort of uh, thank you don for touching on this nationalism and destructive nationalism i'm just sort of wondering with the close, closing of borders and the sort of messaging around the COVID-19 crisis, what sort of impact the panel sees that may have on this debate? So transnationalism um, has sort of shifted, I think, and maybe gone backwards. Uh, so I'd like to, to hear the, the panel's views on that. Okay, so uh, Alistair, would you like to, to answer? Closing of borders is interesting in that particular context because it began in Italy with not national borders being closed but regional borders being closed, mm -hmm. um, and th th that's in a sense part of the European Union's notion of subsidiarity. You devolve mm -hmm. power to the lowest appropriate level, and in something like an outbreak that we had beginning in Italy, it was very much a, a regional issue. It didn't work very well. Um, national borders are easier, even in the European Union, to impose than, than regional borders. Um, but I, th I think we see, the, in contrast, the, the reaction of quite a few European states to the migrants' so-called crisis of 2015, where it was an, an, taken at a national level and extended to the level of, of, of fences and barbed wire and the lot. Um, in terms of young people, I think it's a very much an issue of young people beginning to define themselves in terms of uh, rights that they see that they've acquired through this thing called Europe. Um, and they are very aware both of the freedom of movement for travel, the eventual freedom of movement possibly for work, not simply in the Eastern countries, the post-2004 countries, but also in the older countries and as they discuss between them what that means it becomes stronger and stronger as something that unites them 
across boundaries, across borders, rather than something, something that divides them. Um, so I, I do, do see a real generational difference emerging, not absolute black and white generations, but, but broad tendencies, older people, younger people, and it's something that comes up very frequently in talking. Mm. Thank you. We have Jen uh, waiting for a while. Jen, do you want to ask a question or make a comment? Uh, I think that was that was me asking a question there. So, so I was, I was, I think, I think, um, I think yeah. Alice is right. I think there is a generational difference, but I'm, I'm, I'm seeing um, a kind of worrying trend, and I, and I, uh, in terms of the the message that have been the messages that have been promoted by governments, which are very local. They are regional, and they are. Um, within borders and um it seem it seems a quite a shift so I, I think um it remains to see i think remains to be seen what what the impact of this is on um transnational identity uh making and and how the young react as well as, as the older generation perhaps okay great so so, so when we now have uh Eddie and don uh, well, uh, I mean, my my answer or, or my remarks regarding the effect of the uh, COVID-19 to the uh, previous, quote unquote, previous transnationalism. I mean, as we can see, like every single regime, every single country has been giving different uh, reactions to this disease, but there is an existing common and value between them. I mean, the, despite the diversity among the regimes and their reactions, I mean, as a social scientist, I think it is very early to claim that this the, we kind of define the sovereignty again, there will be an increasing nationalism. It, it is too early because it is obvious that when we finally pass through this terrifying and mind-blowing dystopia, the cards will reshuffle for the world's current leaders and the regimes. But at the same time, we know that, I mean, yes, uh, from the TVs of the UK, we can see that there is a, uh, I mean, nationalism and the, every single country is trying to clear up their, in front of their doors. But when you look at the Asian countries, when you look at the uh, Scandinavian countries, except Sweden, when you look at the North African countries, there is a different kind of a solidarity between states. So, I mean, I think the new world will form ever this slowly, but it is true that clearly the only truth that we must expect, accept at this point regarding the nationalism and the sovereignty and the transnationalism is change. But we don't know which direction yet. I think it's very dangerous for a social scientist to make any futuristic comments from that point. Okay, thanks very much. And Don, uh, would you like to, to, to yeah, just, just a couple to... of observations? Yes. Uh, I think that probably, I mean, you know, given how amazingly well uh, 19th century people were able to communicate with each other, even by by by, by letter, by adverts in newspapers, and by telegraphy, I think that we will that transnational borders or you know the you know crossing borders transnationally will survive. Crossing borders <laughs> will come back. That isn't the big issue. The big issue actually is um, what the borders revealed about the actual fundamental flimsiness of extra national political power and the question of sovereignty. I mean, you know, one by one, the nations of the EU completely abandoned Schengen and each other. Uh, it, you know, the, the few Italians flown to Germany it doesn't exactly strike me as a, the biggest uh, monument to Jean Monnet and actually the cost of this. And whether the whether this you know whether the Italian Spanish uh, burden will really be shared by Germany again, or whether in fact the euro will fall over, everything rests on Germany. Maybe Germany will settle down, but actually there's a lot of protests in Germany. They're pretty fed up with it. There's a lot of conspiracy theory there. A lot of people believe that COVID is just some kind of invention to reap the manipulate society. You know, Germany is you know is a is a country that will, you know is happy to believe some of these conspiracy theories for a range of reasons we can't go into here, we don't have time, but will Germany pick up the tab again? Because the tab this time makes the, the, the bailout in 2008 look like chicken feed. Go, uh, go Don, uh, would you like to say something? Uh, just a, a little observation as well. Um, it was interesting how nationalism entered this uh, situation through, Usually, newspapers and governments attempt to recall a national past, a national history, 
it's interesting to which extent, for example, in Britain, and this is what I observed in Croatia and Serbia and many other places, uh, there were uh, kind of this uh, evocation of particular moments of uh, national victories uh, or glorious past and uh, definitely something like a trauma that was recalled and uh, how uh, that kind of imagery was either successful or not I think another, and this would be interesting for future research, an issue of to which extent there is a trust in government. And I think that this played quite an um, interesting role in how people reacted to different um, um, well, prescriptions from the government and, and this evocation of the national past. Great, thanks, Godana. Don, would you like to add something? I think that's a very interesting point, Godana, and, and I agree entirely. It reminds me, of, it's like going back to the 17th century and kind of uh, John Locke, you know, and the, 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 the idea of circulating in the American Revolution. You know, we have this idea of an alienable and inalienable rights, but some serious rights have been uh, alienated during this crisis. And I think that sort of contractarian sort of relationship between people, peoples, and their states, which we see, you know, obviously they, we see them through the prism of elections and voting, but you know, it's more embedded than that. I think there, there is a risk of challenge to that, I think. And I think it's a very good question you've raised. I think there should be research on that. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm just offering some suggestions again as an historian, but some of these questions were, you know, were deeply important to, to, to people founding free nations in the past. Okay, uh, are there any more questions or, or comments or suggestions? Alistair, yeah? I was interested in reading Gordana's paper about the relationship between nationalism and state, nation and state. And I think there's a terminological con confusion. I'm not the only person to say this about using those two terms as though they're into you into you into into they can be used in the same way they don't mean the same thing um and and it seems to me worrying that we are still talking very much about nations rather than states um because it seems to me that nations are this emotional attachments and states are very much law determines statuses and from Erdi's paper, the way in which we see Erdogan claiming some kind of authority over the diaspora is a an example of the problems that that confusion of terms actually brings about. Um, Rogers Brubacher um, referred to this sort of triadic relationship you get when you, this sort of thing springs up, where a state has assumes it's the same as a nation it finds people of the same nationality who are citizens of another state usually near nearby and claim some authority and responsibility for the people in the other state and this gets it's both into a lot of confusion but also into, into aggression into labeling in a very distinct way um especially when borders become a little bit fluid after wars for example or whatever um and I think we need to get away from using these two terms in, as though they mean the same thing. Um, and I see, I do, I do see nation as being an unhelpful term. Mm -hmm. uh, Gordana, <laughs> do you want to respond? Uh, if I may, just very briefly, I absolutely agree with Alistair's um, this comment because yes, there is a way too much of um, this confusion between the nation and the state but i think it's a rather it would be it's only one of the definitions of a nation to say there is emotional attachment you cannot say that there is no emotional attachment to the state after all we have a word for it and we call it patriotism as well but uh, when we kind of merge the notion of the state and state borders with the people that have a character the people that has have particular values norms and those values of the people that were transmitted, a notion that these values was transmitted from generation to generation and so on, then the blur, well, then we have the notion of nation state. 
I think it would be uh, also impossible to completely, in some cases, to completely separate those two notions. Uh, and the state uh, does not have to be internationally recognized state. It could be a regional government. It could be, well, a country like Scotland that is not officially a recognized state, but yet has all characteristics of, characteristics of statehood. How to distinguish nation with the people? Um, I think you're right. It has to be very careful. And I, I'm trying not to, but to just... Uh, equate nation with emotional attachment, I think it's rather, it's not helpful either. Okay, and Dawn, would you like to say something? Quickly, I think this discussion between Alistair and Godala has raised a really interesting um, point about, about, you know, the need to define terms. Is the state, the apparatus, which a government, which could change, utilizes in, in whatever way, you know, how is it different from the nation, this kind of discussion that's been going on here? Uh, and actually, we need to decide what those terms are. But here's the thing. We shouldn't then select the one that we prefer to write about. We need to deal with the other one because so many books, generally, it's almost generic. They, they, they'll say, you know, this is not a study of the state. This is a study of the nation. By nation, I don't mean, you know, the history and symbolism or whatever of the nation. I'm expressly interested in. And, and the thing about a project that's bigger that might connect us all is that we can actually pick up all of these things and not put things down and actually wrestle with and interpret, if not all of them, many more than we could as individuals. Because this discussion just shows you how many different pillars you need to build your to build your edifice. Excellent. And uh, uh, Ozil, uh, would like to say something as well? Well, from Don's point, if we're gonna define the terms, concepts, or and the agencies, I think in the global world we should define and we should define what is state and what is its borders. I mean, if we talk about nationalism, transnationalism, and uh, transnational state apparatus, I think the, the state is not our old state anymore. And then it's important to define the uh, leverage and the capacity and the reaching point of the state is quite important for this uh, area. And I think the, the as, as uh, Alistair mentioned that, I mean, the Rogers Brubaker is an amazing name for all of these stuff. And it's going to be a very good kickoff point for us. Yes, you can, you, you can define a state's borders. You can't define a nation's borders. If you get to nation defining their borders, you get some incredible difficulties around oh, yeah, yeah. Hungary, Serbia, Bosnia. Yeah, uh, okay, Don? Yeah, the nation becomes the diaspora, and then that's the next definitional problem. Um, I, I, I read a book for a publisher, and it was about the Irish and the Germans in the United States. And there was some interesting stuff about how the Germans went to uh, America and they married Germans. They're all from Württemberg and Baden. And I said, I would just check this because I think some of these Germans are probably Swiss. And of course, lo and behold, they were. And what a difference it made. And that border, which divides the town of Constance from Kreuzlingen, which are twin towns, they've got a metal fence, or they had a metal fence through it until last week for 12 weeks. And people who normally cross the border every single day for work and were married and lived or whatever, you know, had partners inside that border, they couldn't see each other. That's not a border that can ever work. It's a national border. border. Very interesting. Just right. Uh, Gordana. Uh, just one thing. Uh, while it's absolutely very, very difficult to define national border, that's exactly why many wars are waged. Not to define borders of the state, but exactly to define borders of nations. Yeah, and now we also have a comment from Diana. Oh, she left the session. Okay, uh, but we can, we, we can read it. Now, uh, if there are no more burning questions, perhaps uh, Dawn could say a few words about the plans for the future and for the development of area studies. Dawn, would, would you like to say something? Yeah, certainly I will. I mean, this, this group has come together, really. We're all in uh, the Area Studies group. And for those of you who don't know, Area Studies is really an interconnection of, uh, of those who study areas by every definition. It can be micro, local, uh, comparative, local, regional, national, supranational, diasporic. 
I also run through the through the lens of various different theories. It can be historical, literary, it can be sociological, anthropo anthropological, it can it can it can involve gender and social work and all kinds of other things. And and Alison and I have spent a lot of time looking at this. It's a catch-all, but the, but the connection between the subjects is the really interesting thing. It's always been a strong area here, and it was largely an area which, as far as I can see, was was held together by some of the work on on um, on um, uh, labour labour history and some of the European funded projects. But actually, we I mean really we're too small to be. Uh, seven or eight different disciplines. I mean, some, you know, each of us, each discipline is quite small. There are some other historians than me at the institution, but not many. There are a few more sociologists and so on and so forth. And actually what area studies problematizes the connection. It makes, um, it makes, it sets challenges for the connections. As you've seen in these papers, there is something in every paper that can be connected. And probably everyone who gave the paper, as well as many who were listening, will have been thinking, what are the connections? What's my connection to that paper? Where do I where do I plug in? And and actually, I think that that you know, Odi and I obviously connect. But questions of generation, life cycle, and other 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 phrases from Alice's paper, relevant across so many so many um, different approaches to diaspora, to um, nation, to region, and region as supra national and international. Um, and Gordana's um, articulation of economic nationalism as uh, as it, you know, kind of an outgrowth of or a new, uh, the next phase of of uh, neoliberalism, I thought was very convincing. And I think, but also methodologically, that kind of study, which would link very well with um, um, you know the the sort of work in linguistics, corpus linguistics, where you are searching for terms. I'm, I'm very I'm, I, I'm very interested in that kind of work, and I think all of us could use that in our research. So you've got methodology there, you've got theory, you've got different regions, you've got different age groups, you've got life cycle, you've got history, you've got contemporary politics, and area studies is all of those things. And I, and I think one of, one of the obvious things to do is to build on this, not let it disappear. I'm not, you know, you know, you, we might write some papers, we will of course write our own papers, we might write papers together, People listening may contact us and we may end up doing different things. I think we should always look to follow up if we can, bring some other people into a slightly larger entity and have something like a one day seminar or a one day colloquium, something like this. Maybe I mean, this could easily be a conference team, maybe we'd get a lot of people interested. We might hold that thought until we can do it together because uh, both Gordana and I had trouble with the technology and I, you know, it's kind of. It's all right, but it's not as good as the real thing, you know. Uh, anyway, um, but I think also, and I think it's been my final point, I think we need something that's stronger than just our individual selves connecting us across disciplines so we have somewhere to meet regularly as in a research centre. And I'm encouraging people to form research groups or centres, I mean, groups that become centres or centres if there's enough um, vitality, and I think there is. And it could become a great home for regular events. It could become a great, a great, a great place for our PhD students to learn among a wider body of us. But nevertheless, people who add to rather than dissipate their particular um, thematic subject-based interests. And it would be a great vehicle for 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 us all to just grow as a team, uh, as a community. And, and 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 to actually have, make this a regular thing. And there's so many ways in which you can meet. We could read the same book or article and talk about that. We can have brown bag lunches. We can have seminars, conferences. We can have all, all kinds of things. But I think whenever we do something like this, where actually as many questions are raised as are answered, that I don't think we should let it go. And I think that's probably enough for me at three minutes to seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh Thanks a lot, Don. Uh, it's, it's it's really uh, very inspiring. Yeah, uh, to, that we can move on from from this event, which is where we we can meet and and uh, celebrate research to, to something more practical, uh, where where we will start uh, uh, collaborating. Uh,
we 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 are now running out of time so, so i hope that you have all enjoyed the event and uh, yes there will be more contact more exploration of uh, opportunities to conduct research across different disciplines uh, we will be back in a week's time uh, on Thursday, the 28th of May, between 2 and 4 p.m., with a workshop on adolescent mental health. So, so uh, it's quite a diff di uh, different topic, but it's a fascinating area. We, we also have quite a lot of expertise, so uh, you're all invited to that one. And uh, please join me in Erdi, Alistair, Gordon, and Don. For this, for the, for this one, one, one wonderful event, and uh, wherever you are, uh, stay well. Before you say that, we thank you, you Svetlana and Maeve, <laughs> for all the work that you have done to make this happen. Because we, we wrote, we rocked up and did our thing, but actually, we wouldn't have been here if you hadn't created the room. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks, Maeve. Maeve has done a lot to make this happen. So, so stay well, stay healthy, stay alert, <laughs> and stay in touch. And okay. see you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.